Hello and welcome to the Circling the Bases podcast. My name is DJ Short and I'm joined here once again by Drew Silva. This is our latest position preview episode and we're getting on the home stretch here with these episodes. Actually, we've done all position players and we covered the top starting pitchers in our last episode. But today we're going to dig a little bit deeper with those starters, maybe some sleeper picks to come as well. Uh, we covered basically the top 20 starting pitchers last time. Uh, so today we're going to try to go as deep as we can. Uh, I think it was kind of hard, like in previous years, Drew, we would try to squeeze all the pitchers into one episode. And I think that's that's really hard to do, right? Yeah, this is good. And, and we're sort of delaying our relief pitcher episode until maybe <laughs> there's a little more clarity there. Yeah. That, that's just going to be a big emoji <laughs> exactly yes Beyond, before, we get, yeah. before we get into the starters though we're uh, just a quick reminder here about the nbc sports edge fantasy baseball magazine it's out there in stores now uh, i've seen it in a couple of places which is always pretty cool uh the online guide is also available now uh has everything you need to get ready for your fantasy draft and we're also constantly updating it uh, throughout spring training for all the latest injuries and signings and and uh, role changes and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, regardless of what format you play, there's something there to help you. We have new stuff being added all the time. So you can go to NBCSportsEdge.com slash MLB Draft Guide to get started. So like I said, we we did the top 20 starters kind of roughly. We, we each covered our top 20 starters in the last episode. We're, so we're going we're gonna to start from that point basically where it makes sense. Uh, you know, we did talk about uh, Hyunjin Rio in the in the last episode. Uh, I had him at 22. You had him inside your top 20, and I think I kind of changed my mind during the episode that I maybe I would have ranked him a little bit higher. Uh, now, you, you put forth some good points about worrying about the workload and the injury history. Is he really, you know, going to be at, at the top of the innings leaderboard? Probably not. Um, yeah. But he's and and I worry about the ballparks he's going to be pitching in too. But um, yeah. I also, I had Sonny Gray at 21. You had him 20th or? I think I had him like 17th. Yeah. I remember right. Oh, so yeah, we touched on those guys. Go listen to that, that episode. Um, I'll start with, I had Corbin Burns at 22 and he's a very interesting pitcher. Um, he's being treated as a top 20 starter, 18th starter off the board on Yahoo. I can't quite go there. Yeah. Um, but he is an option around this tier that I wouldn't be mad about clicking on. You just got to hope that what he did last year was real and that the numbers will even be close to sustainable. A 2.12 ERA, 1.02 whip, 88 strikeouts in 59 innings. He made big time changes to his, his pitch mix. Lots of sinkers and cutters. That cutter was essentially a new pitch for him and he threw it 31.5% of the time to great effect. Um, also has a slider that rates very well. Uh, good velocity on the four-seam fastball, which he kind of got away from, but it's in his back pocket if he needs to throw it. You just you look at the 8.82 ERA from 2019, and it's, it's scary to draft him. And the fact that he's never thrown more than 60 innings in a major league season. So th the cap on his workload is probably lower, more restrictive than most of the top 20 starting pitchers, I would say. So 17 homers allowed in 49 innings in 2019, yeah. just two in 59 two thirds innings last year, uh, finished six in the national league Cy Young award balloting, just a completely different pitcher. Uh, like you were saying, you know, switched up the pitch mix, ditched the four seam fastball. So we're like, I, I think you can't even look at the 2019 numbers anymore. Cause that was like a, basically a different dude. Yeah, totally agree. Um, who else do I have? D Denelson Lamette, um, one of our favorite sort of mid-tier sleepers going into 2020, and he totally met the hype and then some. A 2.09 ERA, 0 0.85 whip, 93 strikeouts in 69 innings, finished fourth in the NL Cy Young vote. But he had that bicep slash elbow thing that popped up right at the end of the regular season, which caused him to miss the postseason. Uh, his teammate with the Padres, Mike Clevenger, really pushed it. He did pitch in October for all of one official inning and then wound up needing Tommy John surgery. It's not fair to compare these two situations, but the injury risk definitely feels higher with Lamette than, than for most of my top 25. Um, but the upside is obvious, and he could be a quick riser if everything's going well this spring. 
Uh, Lamette had an average draft position of 123.5 this time last year when, when we were doing these positional preview episodes. Mm. It's now 90.1 on Yahoo. That seems about right given the leap forward he took, but also the, the baked in reasons to have some concerns. Yeah, it's it's kind of just all about the health for him. Uh, he has been throwing some sliders in, in some of his side sessions, which is nice. And I guess he's responded well enough that there hasn't been like anything pushed back. Uh, we'll see when he gets into game action and he's, you know, going full effort in those games, how, how he responds. That that remains a big question. But, you know, with what he did on the mound last year, he was fourth in the NL Cy Young Award balloting, uh, backed up all the hype. He was one of the most popular names uh, as a sleeper, like you were saying, uh, in drafts last year. And he, he totally backed that up. I have him number 24 on, on my list just because he's another one of those guys that's like high risk, high reward. Yeah. Um, uh, it could pay off or or it might not, but you're not drafting him to be your ace necessarily. Uh, I have Jose Barrios, uh, 23. I had him 24. And like surface number is not great. Uh, you know, four ERA last year. Uh, the walks were up a little bit, but, you know, he got much better as the year moved along. Looked a lot more like himself. 279 ERA over his final seven starts. I'm just not really worried about him. I think over the course of a full season, he's, I, I don't think he's ever going to be like an ace necessarily, but I think he's like a really, really solid number two fantasy starter. Yeah, to me, he's safety and workload with yeah. maybe a little bit more upside to, to tap into. The floor is palatable, probably an ERA in, in the mid to high threes, a little over yeah. strikeout per inning. Uh, the metrics weren't great last year in a small sample, but they were very good in 2019 over a much larger sample. And his velocity did improve in 2020, which was encouraging. If that trend continues, he's got a real nice season in him as the ace of the defending AL Central champion twins working deep into games uh, with a high potential for wins. And he's safe at age 26 I, with some room to grow, I believe. So I think maybe the most like controversial ranking I might have is is 25. Right after Denelson Lamette, I have his teammate Chris Paddock. Uh, so I'm Paddock maybe... 28, uh, so not too far off. Yeah, I think I think the upside is still so high for Chris Paddock, if there's a rotation spot for him, uh, maybe eventually Mackenzie Gore will, will make that tough. And maybe Chris Paddock will pitch his way into the bullpen. I don't know, but last year, the numbers were not good for Chris Paddock four, seven, three ERA over 12 starts, but still you look at the peripherals, 58 strikeouts, 12 walks and 59 innings. Uh, but no doubt went in the off season with a lot of questions. And even for himself, like I think a lot of self-reflection, He's someone who's typically not like an analytic kind of guy, like some a lot of um, you know successful young pitchers these days. But uh, he did look into his spin rate this off season and the spin efficiency of of his fastball. Um, and you know, with the with the help of the Padres, you know, they kind of showed him these things, things that maybe he his mind wasn't open to in the past. And he said, like quote unquote, it blew my mind, and like. That's really big, I think, uh, you know, that he has that data. Sometimes it's just about how these teams present it. Yeah. You know, when you hear analytics, like sometimes that can be a turnoff for people, uh, you know, but it, if you get talked to the right way, like it can be really eye opening for, for players. And uh, I think I think he has a lot of bounce back potential and I'm, I'm pretty excited to see where this goes for him this year. Yeah, that, that could be something that clicks for him and, and he evolves. He's 25 years old. Not going to knock him down too far. Uh, had the 3-3-3 ERA, 0 0.98 whip, 153 strikeouts over his first 104 major league innings in 2019. Went pretty early in drafts last year and did not return that level of faith, but there's still a ton to like there. Um, the control was good as it has been his entire pro career, dating back to his minor league days with the Marlins. Uh, remember that the Padres got Paddock straight up from Miami for Fernando Rodney back in 2019. Man, they got some. <laughs> they got really lucky with these deals. Yeah, oh, <laughs> the okay. James Shields for Tatis, and yeah. Um, I had Ian Anderson at number 25. 
Uh, I have him. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm scrolling down, which isn't a good sign. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I I was hoping he would fly <laughs> a little more under the radar than he has, but he's a top 100 pick right now on Yahoo. After after essentially being a September call up for the Braves, made his his debut on August 26th and then tore it up. A 1.95 ERA, 41 strikeouts, over 32 and a third regular season innings. Then had a 0.96 ERA with 24 strikeouts, over 18 and two thirds innings, four starts in the playoffs against some of the best teams in baseball. He merged those together. He's got a 1.59 ERA, 65 strikeouts over his first 51 major league innings. Um, he was the third overall pick out of high school in 2016, proved himself on a, a steady buildup through the minor leagues. He looks like the real deal, and I'm not as concerned about workload here as you'd usually be for a 22-year-old who's only made six regular season MLB starts. I mentioned the minor league buildup. He was at 135 and two-thirds innings in 2019 between AA and AAA. So pushing toward being a, a 150 to 160 inning pitcher last year, gotten a lot of mound time at the alternate training site before the, the Braves called him up. Um, they could lean on him a little bit heavier than people expect this season. And it looks to me like he's built he's built up to this and that he would be up for a sizable workload. Uh, the the changeup is beautiful. Um, I, I, th I, I think he's legit. I think he's legit too. I, I think I just would have wanted to see a little bit more for him to crack my top 30. Um, I think he is 38 for me. Uh, I'm, well, I'm glad we vary on, on at least one, man. I'm, I'm yeah. an Ian Anderson fan. I like him, but I actually put Max Freed at 30, and I'm not super psyched on Max Freed this year, Yeah, to be honest. After what he did last year, 2.25 ERA over 11 starts. Uh, but, you know, the strikeout rate isn't, like, overwhelming. Uh, so for the ADP, 68.05, I'm just not – He's not really buying that right now. Yeah. Um, I, I think he can't hang with those guys. And I, I could see Freed's ERA, you know, kind of being closer to what he did in 2019, which was still like fine, but I don't see the ERA being sub three. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you there. I have him 27th, uh, just kind of based on what he's, he's done so far, but I'm not super happy about it. I had Kyle Hendricks at 26. He just I have him 27. Okay, Please? good. I thought I was a little high on him. You, you just know what you're getting there. Yeah. Um, you're getting a good ERA, not a ton of strikeouts, but super reliable, and he'll definitely have a big workload. Um, no doubt about that. Uh, let's see. I, Zach Wheeler at 29, and then Steven Strasburg rounding out my top 30. I'm not going to draft Strasburg. I just, it felt like he had to be top 30 because of the potential. And I know. I know. I was in the same boat. I put Strasburg 26, I put Wheeler 28. And Wheeler was like a really weird pitcher last year. Yeah. Uh, had the shiny ERA, 292 ERA, but uh, just 53 strikeouts in 71 innings, which is really strange. Uh, and, and I think maybe the Phillies just wanted him to be a more efficient pitcher. Uh, you know, allowed just three homers, so getting the ball on the ground, uh, you know, limiting hard contact. I think those are things maybe the Phillies wanted him to do. Uh, but if those strikeouts aren't going to be there, I don't know. Like, does it balance itself out a little bit? Uh, and does he pitch deeper into games and more chances for wins? I don't know. Uh, but the, you know, the strikeouts are such a big deal in baseball right now that, you know, there's going to be a limit to his ceiling, I think. Yeah. I, I find him kind of boring to be honest. Um, but the strikeouts should bounce back. Not that he was ever like a huge strikeout guy, but he was at least at a he strikeout. He throws hard. Running. I mean, he throws yeah. hard. That hasn't changed. Yeah. But and it's with, weird to see in today's game. You know what I mean? I think we're just so used to the strikeouts that when you see a pitcher throwing like how pitchers used to pitch to contact, it's a, it's a little bit strange. Um, I have Lance McCullers at 29. I'm big on him this year. Uh, I... I think there's obvious, you know, injury questions, workload questions for Lance McCullers, but man, if, if he's right, like he has ace potential as well. Uh, yeah. 393 ERA over 11 starts last year. There were a couple of clunkers in there, which I think inflated those numbers, but uh, kind of just typical stuff for McCullers, 56 strikeouts, 20 walks. I think the curveball wasn't quite the same, 
Uh, but maybe as he gets, you know, a little more back to normal, I think, yeah. you know, he'll, he'll be kind of closer to his usual self. I think there's all the same questions are going to be there about the, about the injury history and stuff, but he's another one of those guys. It's like, everybody has workload questions this year. So I'm not going to hold it against them too much. And I think his ADP is 123.28. I think that's awesome. And I'd certainly take my chances there. Definitely a guy toward the middle of the draft. You don't feel bad about grabbing him on a turn. Yeah. Um, so let's bounce around here for a bit and just pick out some guys we want to talk about. Sure. Outside of our top 30s. Uh, so I've, I've Jesus Lazardo at 33. You know, the biggest issue with Luzardo is, is workload, what his workload will be. We know the stuff is there, high 90s fastball, wicked breaking pitches, great changeup, and he throws all of them. Um, he, he doesn't, like, tinker around, even with some different variations of his slider. I just I love the overall pitch mix. Um, he had some trouble with his shoulder that delayed his arrival to the major leagues, and, and the only time he's logged more than 100 innings in his pro career was in 2018 when he went 109 to third innings between high A, double A, and triple A. Uh, so will the A's let him work deep into games? What's the innings cap here? Those concerns are, are legitimate, but you know they're in some ways built into his draft stock. Lazardo's pretty well known by now, the long-term upside that he has. And if we could guarantee 160 innings this year, he'd be going a lot higher than he is, even after a relatively mediocre 2020, which – can in some ways be blamed on COVID. He was diagnosed uh, at intake testing for summer camp. Might help explain some of the velocity dips across all of his pitches. Um, you, know, you see that in, in other players' data that they were just sort of fatigued, except Freddie Freeman somehow, um, who was like on his deathbed <laughs> and then won an NL MVP. But I, I see Luzardo doing big things in 2020 to the extent that the A's let him you know, that the distances that they let him go in individual games and the overall innings it is a concern, but he's, he's got the stuff to be a fantasy ace when he's out there. So I think Zach Plesak is probably one of the most like polarizing yeah. pitchers this year in that I couldn't tell you if he's going to maintain what he did last year, two, two, eight ERA, uh, 0 0.795 whip over eight starts, just amazing numbers, 57 strikeouts, eight walks and 55 in a third innings, you know, made some changes with his pitch mix. Um, you know, his fastball isn't, you know, he's not throwing a hundred miles an hour or anything like that, but, you know, slider and change up are, are really good pitches for him. Uh, you know, changed uh, the movement with his pitches have, have adjusted over time. The swinging strike rate uh, went up last year. Strikeout went, rate went up a lot, 18.5% in 2019. Uh, last year, though, 27.7%. Uh, um, but I, I guess the reason I'm a little bit skeptical here is uh, you look at the batting average on balls in play, and especially on, like, you know, a, a small sample like he had, just eight starts. Uh, he was at 224 last year. And to me, that just screams that something's going to correct here at some yeah. point. Um now in 2019, he was he still maintained like a low BABIP against it was 255. So the question is over a larger sample is like he one of those guys that can beat that because we see that happen sometimes. But I think there's just too much history and evidence to suggest that things will kind of even out for him. Uh, it was interesting. Like he's not one of those guys you can discount because he pitched in the central because uh, of his eight starts. Three of them actually came against the White Sox. Like he was one of those few pitchers who was not so fortunate uh, with the schedule, and he pitched well despite that. Um, the ADP is sixty-seven point eight zero, though, and I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm going to go anywhere near that. I, I just don't see it happening. I have Sixto Sanchez at, at thirty-four. I did uh, a PitchCon panel last month, late last month, with a bunch of smart fantasy people scott pianowski at yahoo jason collette max greenfield casey bubba and the panel was about breakout players how how to identify them on the hitting side and the pitching side what do you look for etc um, and with the pitchers it's like oftentimes strikeouts right this guy had a 13.2 k per nine in the minor leagues he must have some pretty nasty stuff you know, he's going on my watch list but sixto is, is sort of in the shane beaver column of prospects who 
rise through the professional ranks on elite command with still good stuff and, and don't make the strikeouts jump until a little later on in their careers. That That's the narrative that I'm going with anyway, that Sixto Sanchez is capable of a Shane Bieber like jump. Um, he's, he's got the arsenal to do it. High nineties, fastball, sometimes triple digits, four seam fastball, a wicked change up and slider. He actually needs to intentionally pitch out of the zone more. Um, to become a true fantasy ace, he probably doesn't care about becoming a fantasy ace. Um, 1.7 walks per nine in the minors. That's a span of 335 plus innings. The script is laid out. You know, will he make that jump this year in the strikeouts? Will the workload be there? Um, I'm I'm willing to take a chance on on him where he's being drafted, which is just inside the top 40 starters off the board on Yahoo at least. I like Pablo Lopez a lot in that Marlins rotation too. I have Lopez at 37, uh, but 36 for me is Joe Musgrove, uh, 129.33 ADP, which I think is a is a really good value right now. Uh, 3.86 ERA over eight starts last season, 55 strikeouts, 16 walks, in 39 and two thirds innings, and it was kind of like a, a real roller coaster ride uh, for Musgrove last year. Uh, actually missed some time with uh, triceps inflammation. Um, But in September, though, he was amazing. 2.16 ERA, 38 to 5 strikeout to walk ratio in September, especially as the last two starts against two pretty good teams, Uh, your Cardinals and the Indians. He struck out 21 batters over his final two starts. And uh, he actually switched up his pitch mix last year. Like he's one of those guys that are coming up through the minors, you know, with the Astros, like we always heard about his control. We're yeah. kind of waiting for the strikeouts to, to arrive in the majors. And he threw his curveball a bit more last year and had really good results. Um, so moving over to San Diego now where he's going to get a ton of run support. Um, I, I, I think he's on the rise. I think he's someone that could really sneak into like top 25 starter value potentially uh so i think he's pretty exciting especially at this adp yeah I, I have him at 38 and that that's i have all five locked in padre starters within the top 40 yeah cr- crazy pretty good off season yes. um 35 i have kevin gossman uh one of my favorite deep sleepers last year I, and i promise this you can go back and listen to that at that episode you, you did say that yeah. and i i was doubting you but it worked <laughs> out for once it worked out yeah well, let's not talk about what tyler white and sam hilliard <laughs> maybe i'm better at pitching analysis um, but gossman had a 572 era between the braves and reds in 2019 so there was not a, a whole lot of reason to think he'd make this jump, but the, the FIP, the fielder independent pitching was two runs lower than that. And he posted the highest strikeout rate of his career, thanks to an increase in velocity and higher, higher usage rate on his splitter. Uh, and he continued all of that in, in, on that same tra- trajectory in 2020 pitched to a 3.09 FIP 3.62 ERA with 79 strikeouts and 59 innings for the giants. He's always been a, a good command guy and, and has now at age 30 developed a better overall plan of attack, essentially. The Giants probably helped him continue that progression. They're a smart, analytical team, and he's back with them after accepting their one-year $18.9 million qualifying offer over the winter, sort of betting on himself that he can write this next chapter of his career. He was a top prospect way back when with the, the Orioles, and I'm buying into the changes he's made, the velocity he's added, and he's a free agent next year because of that qualifying offer. So the Giants can push him hard if they want to, um, and they might need to. That rotation has a lot of red flags. Like, what are you going to get from Johnny Cueto? Um, Anthony Desclafani, Alex Wood is going to get hurt, of course, and Aaron Sanchez right now. I, kinda, I think Aaron Sanchez is pretty fascinating. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, we've been saying that for how many years now? <laughs> like, right. I, I agree with you, but, you know, and Alex Wood is fa- fascinating, and Anthony DeSclafani is fascinating, but um, I wouldn't say that any of them are super reliable. Yeah, absolutely not. So before we continue, just a quick note that if you want to get our online draft guide or really any of our premium products, we have a special offer for you. Use promo code BASES10 for 10%. For 10% off any premium subscription, NBC Sports Edge Plus can be either monthly or annual and for any tier. 
Not only do you get access to our draft guide, but you also get season tools for NBA and NHL, uh, which are in season right now, of course. So it's a great value and can help you if you just play baseball or if you do all the sports. So remember, it's promo code BASES10. You can go to NBCSportsEdge.com slash MLB Draft Guide to get started. So uh, going a little further down the list for me, um, you know, Marco Gonzalez, I think, is super underrated. Yes. Uh, not super sexy name, but uh, I have him 46, but maybe he should be higher. I'm 45, uh, so higher than you. Wow. Uh, so Tyler Malley, I have at 47, and I've always found Tyler Malley like really, really fascinating. Yeah. Uh, 175.78 ADP for him. Uh, last year had a 3.59 ERA, 60 strikeouts in 47 and two thirds innings. He's uh, he's definitely one of those pitchers that like year to year is constantly switching his pitch mix. So I don't know how he's going to how he's going to show up this year. But uh, last year, it really worked out for him. I, I think he, you know, he's kind of uh, ditched the curveball for him, like didn't really work for him. So he relied more on the slider last year, or I guess a, kind of a hybrid slider cutter worked for him really well uh and the splitter was a really good pitch for him as well i i don't know i i think over a full season there's obviously questions you know when you only make nine starts but he's someone who showed that upside in the past we've seen flashes for basically the past three years but to see him get those swings and misses last year i think is really promising and i think he can make a big leap this year i had david price at 39 and i'll probably get a lot of shares of price this year because i don't think many other people have him as a top 40 starter yeah. uh, but you look to 2019 prior to his opt-out last year he had the highest strikeout rate of his career and he had an era in the low threes before his wrist began acting up down the stretch his final stretch with the red sox it was a cyst in his wrist which eventually required surgery uh, but it, it was just to remove the cyst there's nothing really concerning long term there I'm a, I'm, I'm a fan of the narrative that a full year off could be good for Price. He racked yeah. up over 2,100 innings across the first 12 years of his career between Tampa Bay, Detroit, Toronto, and Boston. Finally joining the, the Dodgers rotation this, this season after being packaged in the Mookie Betts trade from last winter. And I think he's really going to love being part of that team. Um, and uh, it's another narrative like that he's just going to enjoy himself in Los Angeles. Uh, the 51st starter off the board on average across the major fantasy sites. So I don't know. I, I'd say he's more of a forgotten guy than getting any bump from name appeal. Um, I, I, he's a good value if you can get him at 51st, the 51st starter off the board. That's that's towards the end of a, a standard 12-team draft. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if you're in a deeper league, I, that's kind of like the mid to late round kind of like dart throw territory. Yeah. And I would happily take my chances on on David Price. Yeah, um, I think it's a great situation. A pitcher we liked a lot uh, going on the last year, last spring, uh, Jose Urquidy uh, didn't really work out for him. He actually only threw 29 and two third regular season innings. Uh, but he was mostly good during the team's postseason run. He he missed about six weeks during the regular season uh, for undisclosed reasons. Uh, there was a lot of that last year, obviously. Uh, but I think if he got a full season, you know, we would have seen that breakout potentially. Uh, really good, com- really good command with his pitches. Not overpowering with the fastball, but uh, has a really good arsenal. Really good secondary pitches. His changeup, I, I think, is his true out pitch but i think he could be a legit breakout pitcher this year and and really because i think some of these other names with the astros have emerged over the past year including a uh, framber valdez who unfortunately is hurt uh that arkady like people aren't really paying attention to him and i think they still should be i agree with that i had him at 49th um 47th i'll head on who i have at 47 and 48 real quick uh, mike soroka 47 probably a, a better real life pitcher than fantasy pitcher and you know maybe those things will merge at some point in his career um 171 strikeouts through his first 214 major league innings here at age 23 uh, but the era is great 2.86 he throws a lot of sinkers limits hard contact it could be a while before he takes a step forward in, in whiff rate if he ever does and there's also the element that we don't know exactly when 
Soroka will be ready to join the Braves rotation this year after he suffered a ruptured Achilles tendon in his third start of the 2020 season. It sounds like he's coming along nicely this spring in Braves camp, but there's no official timetable as we record here in early March. It sounds like he'll open the season on the injured list, um, but maybe is back around mid to late April. Love the craftiness, the soft contact, the run prevention. But with the lack of you know projectable strikeouts upside going into this year paired with the uncertain health, I think just inside the top 50 starters seems right for me, and, and maybe that's even too high. Um, and then I also have Tristan McKenzie at 48. McKenzie was you know, rounding into one of the top pitching prospects in baseball in the early part of his pro career and then missed large chunks of 2018 and 2019, actually all of 2019 because of back and pectoral issues. Uh, so he wasn't really on the radar for me entering the 2020 season, but the Indians put him at their alternate training site, and he wowed enough there that the Tribe went to him in late August when they were needing starters uh, because Mike Clevenger and Zach Plesek broke COVID restrictions on the road in Chicago, if you remember that whole ordeal. Um, and McKenzie had an amazing MLB debut. It was against the Tigers, but 10 strikeouts, two hits, one walk, and six innings of one run ball. And a lot of very good starts followed that one. Only really had a single poor outing, and that was a three-homer day against the Twins. Um, I, it's it's a situation where let, let's see if he can do it again, but relative to some of the other pitching prospects that broke through last year and accomplished something, he's going late. McKenzie's at 186 overall right now on Yahoo. I'm a believer. You look at the minor league numbers, you look at the prospect pedigree before the injuries, he, he was a stud. Yeah, he's actually on my TGFBI roster. Uh, I have Kershaw, Sonny Gray, uh, Lance McCullers, and Tristan McKenzie right now. So I wanted to get like one of those young pitchers who could make a leap and be a breakout guy this year. I think he's a pretty good candidate uh, to be that guy. The workload probably won't be huge because he did miss all of 2019. But totally. in this range with the stuff he's got, uh, I think it's worth a shot. So we were talking about David Price a little bit earlier. I think Marcus Stroman is kind of in that same area. Price maybe a little bit more upside because I think you can probably bank on the strikeouts a little bit more. Uh, but I think Stroman should be really good too. Uh, had a calf injury uh, and then eventually just decided to opt out uh, due to COVID-19 uh, concerns. But uh, I think he's evolved a little bit. Um, he's a really smart pitcher um, and kind of always tinkering as well. He's actually added a new pitch that he showed off in his uh, first Grapefruit League start, um, which is almost like his first start in a year, I guess. Um, a split change, uh, which looked really good. Um, and he, you know, for a while, he was kind of like a more of a sinker guy. Uh, but he, uh, in 2019, he was throwing more uh, cutters and sliders. So try to get more strikeouts, fewer ground balls, but still he's going to get his fair share. And I think he's going to be pretty happy to have Francisco Lindor behind him at, at shortstop uh, and Jeff McNeil back in his comfortable position at, at second base. Uh, I think he's going to be someone who probably will have an ERA like, you know, mid to high threes. Uh, but I think he's he's going to be a very useful, like a fourth or fifth starter on a mixed league staff. Yes. Stroman's going late for the caliber, like the caliber of pitcher that he is. Absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of that, I have John Means at 50. He is a better pitcher than what his 4.53 ERA from last year, which would leave you to, lead you to believe um, a lot was going on for him. He developed dead arm right at the end of summer camp and opened the season on the injured list. And that summer camp was a weird buildup or, or rebuild up for some pitchers. Right. You know, then he gets activated on or August 30th or July 30th, I forget, and gets rocked by the Yankees. Yeah, it was July 30th. Uh, it gets rocked by the Yankees. A little while later, goes on the bereavement list following the death of his father. Um, has to go back through COVID-19 intake testing when he returns to the team, and that took a while. So with everything that went down, it's incredible that how he finished the year. One run allowed in each of his final four starts, which were at the Mets, at Yankee Stadium, then hosting the Rays and at Buffalo against the Blue Jays. Uh, 21 strikeouts over 11 and two thirds innings in those final two starts against the Rays and Blue Jays. He was really good in 2019 AL all-star. I believe the Orioles only representative in the all-star game. Um, second in AL rookie of the year that year. Uh, and there might be more here than people realize 
he, he means has some tough matchups coming on, on a bad Orioles team, which has to factor in. Uh, that's why he's just inside my top 50 and instead of a little bit higher. I, he's a really good pitcher. So when you get into these mid to late rounds of drafts, there's three names to me that, that stick out guys returning from injury that have massive potential. Uh, Jameson Tyone, who I have at 54. Uh, and then as you dig a little bit deeper, and I actually think these guys are starting to go a little bit higher in draft size seen recently. Corey Kluber at 55 for me, Shohei Otani at 61. Yeah. What do you Those do with Otani, man? Yeah. He has looked amazing in every a- aspect. Yeah. I, I, I think where he's going right now, it's going to change dramatically yeah. <laughs> really, really soon. He's supposed to pitch on Friday. So uh, we're recording this Thursday. So by the time this show comes out, we'll already know, you know, how he did. Uh, but the re- the early bullpen sessions and stuff, he's throwing a hundred miles an hour. I mean, the potential is through the roof. If he can H- hit bombs, game. like yeah. in, re- in real cactus league games, please give us one full two way player Shohei Otani season, and then I don't care what happens from there. <laughs> I want to see it one time. But if you wanted to, like, I have him sixty-one Otani. Like, that's not going to happen. Like, no, that's he's going to be off the board sooner than that. At this point, I think that's definitely fair to say, uh, and I totally get it. If if you want to take a stab on him over like over a Soroka, over a Zach Eflin, over a Marcus Stroman. I get it if you want to do that. That totally makes sense to me. I've, I've written up a few mock drafts for our draft guide already for the magazine and for the online, and I just avoid the Otani topic because it's it's like I don't want to get my hopes up, and, and it's a little bit convoluted about which sites treat him as a, as a pitcher or hitter and where is he going to be valuable this year. Um, or if he's a guy you can use in both spots, it's it's a like a complicated situation. But it's difficult to be you know one size fits all with like what we're talking about right now. Yes, but, exactly. And the hitter part of it was interesting too because last year he struggled, uh, at least in yeah. comparison to the previous years. He still hit for power. He's still really fast, which I think is an understated part of his game. How how quick he is! A hell of an athlete. Um, but he had knee surgery toward the end of 2019, and he said that that impacted him at the plate last year. Like he just wasn't up to full strength with his, with his knee uh, and impacted him at the plate. So uh, certainly a good sign to see him clear the the batting eye with that massive home run he hit the other day. I, if he's healthy, I think he's going to hit and he's going to be fine. Uh, so I think either way, things are, are looking really encouraging for him right now. Um, and Kluber pretty encouraging for him too is his first start uh, with the Yankees on Wednesday through two perfect innings, struck out a few batters, uh, looked, looked good. Uh, we'll see. I mean, he really hasn't pitched in like two years. Yeah. Um, but as late as he's going, I think you, you, you're fine with taking your chances with that. Yeah. If he's your fifth or sixth starter in a standard league, you feel pretty good. You can drop him if, if he just doesn't pan out. Yeah. Um, Eduardo Rodriguez, I had at 57, rooting for the guy. Uh, missed all last season after testing positive for COVID-19 before the start of summer, summer camp. Developed myocarditis. Am I saying that right? Um, so. A com a common heart condition now that you know is a is a, a symptom of COVID or a result of COVID. Right. I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. Clearly, um, couldn't walk at one point. Uh, just scary stuff. But he says he's 100 percent this spring in Red Sox camp and wants to make 30 plus starts. You definitely don't know what you're going to get from Erod, and I could understand ranking him quite a bit lower. But he was really good in 2019, limiting hard contact with a very good whiff rate. 509 strikeouts over his last 470 innings since the beginning of 2017. Uh, 3.81 ERA, 122 ERA plus between 2018 and 2019. Wouldn't mind taking him as my final starter in a standard draft and hoping for the best. And if it doesn't work out, you you stream that spot for a while. Sure. So uh, I had Nate Pearson ranked number 63. uh, And this was before the grade one strain of his right groin uh, that was announced Thursday in uh, Blue Jays camp. And maybe this is like a happy accident for the Blue Jays. Um, yeah. Because obviously Nate Pearson wasn't going to throw 150 innings probably <laughs> this year. I don't think that was going to happen. They also have like a ton of options for their rotation. 
veteran arms there that they can throw in for a little while. Ross Stripling, Stephen Matz. I mean, they they have a lot of guys they can put in there temporarily. It doesn't seem like the the injury with Pearson is like overly serious. So, you know, give them a few extra weeks to get ready and bring them up in late April or activate them in late April. And I think he'll be fine. Um, but I think it gets a little harder to count on him uh, coming out of the year where uh, there might have been a lot more excitement uh, in drafts in the coming weeks. And maybe that works to your advantage. I think sometimes it's nice to to get that guy you know is going to start the season on the injured list, but will be ready fairly soon. Uh, so it's sort of like a free roster spot, which you, sometimes you can take advantage of. I had Christian Javier at 59, so just inside my top 60. Uh, he's an interesting pitcher. Doesn't throw as hard as you'd think when you look at his great numbers from the minor leagues and the success he had last year as a rookie. Um, but it all seems to work without having that elite fastball. In his 377 career minor league innings, he has a 2.22 ERA and 12.2 K per nine. 512 strikeouts in 377 innings. Um, just outstanding overall run prevention, too. Is the control good enough? Is can he get by in the majors without an elite fastball? Um, he does throw some nice breaking stuff, and there's spin on everything, including the fastball. It's something the Astros um, have really perfected. It, it feels like major league hitters might make an adjustment to him. He's a bit of a junk baller, um, and, he, and he walks a lot. But there's something here, and he just got a whole lot more important to the Astros in 2021 with Framber Valdez fracturing his thumb. We still don't know the prognosis there. There was a report from John Heyman that he might be out for the season, which seems weird. Um, <clears throat> yeah. there, sh there should be more on that by the time people hear this episode. Yeah, that was certainly a strange thing because I was watching the game and I, like, it seemed like such a benign play, like, like nothing happened. And he actually stayed in the game uh, and faced five more batters. Yeah. And then afterwards he was asked about it and he said he was fine. So it, it's weird how that all came together and really a shame because you know, Valdez was understatedly the best pitcher on the Astros last season, and they certainly need him yeah. uh, with Verlander out for the year, recovering from Tommy John surgery, Zach Greinke, um, who we didn't talk about, which is, is weird, but like he's not, he, I don't think you can necessarily count on him to be the ace that he was before. I mean, he is super smart and I think he's going to adapt and be fine, but one of these days, you got to think like the velocity that, that Greg has <laughs> thrown with these days. Uh, and I'm not talking about the EFIS pitch. I'm talking about like the 89 mile per hour fastballs. I don't know if that's going to work for, for much longer. Yeah. But, um, I have Yusei Kikuchi at 68, and he's someone I've been taking in a lot of drafts early on. Uh, and the ADP is like off the map. You can get him for free, basically. Uh, and that's because he had a 5.17 ERA over nine starts last season. But if you look under the hood, I mean, I think there's a lot to be excited about here. The velocity, his fastball velocity last year was up almost three miles per hour from where he was in, in 2019. Uh, strikeout rate was way up as well. He was 16.1 in 2019, up to 24.2% uh, last year, induced more ground balls as well. So like, all these kind of secondary numbers are usually like the things we point to for a breakout. And he has these things, whether he can maintain it over a full season, you know, we'll see, but he was a really good pitcher in Japan. And there was a lot of uh, excitement when he signed with the Mariners. And uh, I think we certainly shouldn't overlook him going into drafts this year. Jordan Montgomery, I was considering for my top 60. I might actually put him up there when we file these rankings for our outliers and showdowns in the online NBC Sports Edge draft guide, which everyone should get. Um, you look at the 5.11 ERA from last year from, from Montgomery, the injury history, and it's easy to sort of breeze past him, but he had a 3.65 XFIP uh, last year, so he, he should have had a better ERA, like maybe even two runs better. 65 left on base percentage, 320 batting average on balls in play, lots of bad luck in this data. He gained velocity, had 47 strikeouts and only nine walks in 44 innings. And he's, I don't know, to me, suddenly like the second most reliable pitcher in that Yankees rotation behind Garrett Cole. Corey Kluber, Jamison Tyon, both coming off, you know, major, I don't know, what would you call it, idle periods because of injuries. 
Uh, who knows? Who knows what they'll get from Domingo Herman? Davy Garcia could be up in a, a rotation mainstay at some point. Um, Montgomery could really shine this year, and the Yankees might need him to shine. ADP right now is two fifty two point two, basically free in a standard draft. So one pitcher I'm probably not going to draft anywhere this year is Dallas Keuchel. Uh, and, you know, I, I think people are, are smart to this. Uh, ADP yeah. is 197.6 on NFC, uh, despite a 199 ERA over 11 starts last year. But you can easily see why this isn't going to happen again. Yeah. Uh, 42 strikeouts in 63 in a third inning. So uh, his lowest strikeout rate, uh, the ground ball rate, it wasn't in line with anything we've seen in the past. Uh, didn't give up a lot of home runs last year, but he did in 2019. The fastball velocity isn't in line with anything we've seen in the past. I think it could get a little ugly this year. Uh, but where he's being drafted, you're not really expecting him to be like a top line pitcher. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at the ERA at all with him going into drafts this year. So this is outside my top 60, but I have two guys here that are certainly draftable or at least, I don't know, rosterable with maybe unique value this year. Tony Gonsolin of the Dodgers and Freddie Peralta of the Brewers, but both set for those swing swingman piggyback type of roles this year as teams shorten starts and overall workloads for even their aces. These types of utility pitchers, I guess we'll call them, could get you about a start per week in total innings, probably you know, separated out into multiple innings per week or we'll, we'll be ready to step into rotation spots should that path open. Gonsolin has a, a 2.60 ERA, 0.92 whip, and 83 strikeouts in 86 innings since debuting in June 2019 uh, on a really good Dodgers team that, that likes to get flexible. Could vulture some wins uh, with the reigning World Series champs. Peralta has always had awesome stuff. Im- improving command, it, it seems like there are indications of that. 47 strikeouts in 29 and a third innings last year. That's a 14.4 K per nine. And he has a 12.1 K per nine for his career. Um, the Brewers are going to use him a lot as, as a multi-inning reliever and perhaps getting some starts or picking back, piggybacking off some of their other starters, maybe trying to save some bullets for Brandon Woodruff or Corbin Burns or you know whoever else is in that rotation. Another pitcher that's going to begin the year in the bullpen is Michael Kopech with the White Sox. Uh, it does seem like that is likely to change over the course of the year, and he could eventually get into the rotation. So I think he's a name to watch, but not someone you're going to draft initially. But he's someone we've been talking about for a really long time who has that kind of potential. So I think he's a name to watch. Other prospects, Mackenzie Gore with the Padres, if there's ever an opening in that rotation, uh, you got to watch out for him. The Tigers trio trio yeah. of young pitchers. Um, I don't know if any of them will make the opening day roster because I, I feel like the Tigers have signed a bunch of veteran starters uh, who could, you know, hold down a spot for a month or whatever the Tigers want to do as far as service time is concerned. But, uh, you know, Mize, Manning, Scooble, a lot of promise there. It's Manning is time. awesome. I mean, yeah. they, they all put, could potentially be awesome, but. Manning yeah. Manning really stands out for me. Logan Gilbert with the Mariners. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about service time with the Mariners. Gilbert's pretty close. Uh, nobody's talking about Spencer Howard with the Phillies anymore, but I think he's worth paying attention to. They do have a lot of options for the back end of the rotation, so we'll see. I think the interesting thing uh, about starting pitchers this year, like even if coming out of your draft you're not feeling great, there's three guys that will be around by midseason who could totally change your fortunes. Uh, Noah Syndergaard, Luis Severino, Chris Sale, uh, yep. all coming back from Tommy John surgery. By midseason, they should all be back with their respective clubs. And these are guys, Syndergaard, Severino, and of course Sale, have been top 10 fantasy starters before, top 12. Uh, I don't know. Syndergaard, we've always kind of been waiting for him to put it all together, but you know, those three guys can be fantasy aces um, and can make a big impact during the season. So even if you get off to a slow start, if you stash one of those guys, you know, there could be some big things coming your way. I could keep going on and on. I'll, I'll, my, my closing comment for the show would be watch out for Alex Reyes. And I'm a, I'm a Cardinals homer, of course. I've got my 
World Series okay. 2011, but he looked awesome last year. Um, he threw tonight, Thursday night, in, in the Grapefruit League, a night game. No hits, no walks, three strikeouts. The command looks incredible. This was one of the best prospects in baseball three years ago, and he's had some personal life issues, uh, lost a young child, um, had some injuries, of course, but he has incredible stuff and he looks like his old self right now. And he's, he's gunning for a rotation spot too. Like I'm not talking about him taking over the closer role or, or anything. I think he might take Carlos Martinez's rotation. Yeah. Spot. I was going to ask that. Cause I know Martinez got hit pretty hard or, or Kwon Young Kim, who has not looked sharp so far in camp. And you don't want to put too much into spring training outings, but, and miles Michaelis hasn't pitched yet there. There's an opening there for Alex Reyes to take. And if he gets it, that's a determined guy, and I think he's really, really – I mean, we, we know he's talented, but he's finally got health on his side. He said he, he feels better than he ever has. Everyone says that in spring training, but that's that's. My, I'll leave it at that. A couple guys, you know, before we go, because, I mean, this is a lot of fun. We, we could dig even deeper. Uh, two guys I think we lo- I liked a lot going into drafts last year, Adrian Hauser with the Brewers – Griffin Canning with the Angels. Like, don't forget guys like this. Or even, like, Rich Hill with the Rays. Like, if he can stay healthy a little... I mean, you're assuming he probably will get hurt at some point. But, like, he's a guy who's capable of going on a nice run with a smart team like the Rays. If they manage him well, I think he could be useful, too. Yep. Um, but, yeah, we could go on and on. I, but I, we probably I, shouldn't. <laughs> I, I, I have notes on some other pitchers, but let's let's not. Let's close it's it has been a lot of fun, though. Yeah. Our next episode, I don't think, will be nearly as fun because we'll be talking about closers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Let's but call stay in tuned some, for that. Uh, yeah, call in some replacements for that one. <laughs> uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, seriously, we'll dig in as much as we can uh, to help you guys out because certainly it's it's a it's a confusing it's more confusing this year than ever before. Uh, so we'll do our best to prepare you for that. If you like what you're hearing with this show, Circling the Bases, be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. I have to keep saying Circling the Bases because I'm still getting used to it. Uh, So make sure to make sure to subscribe uh, wherever you get your podcasts. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please rate and review if you don't mind. Follow us on Twitter. If you don't already, I'm at DJ Short. Drew is at Drew Silve. Be safe out there and we will see you next time.